I was asked or tasked to speak on the topic of spirituality within our families. And from the audience that I see here today, I see that there are many families, many mothers with young children, and also women who are in the process, a young woman as well, and as I'm sure the same on the men's side. So it sounds like it's a very relevant discussion, inshallah ta'ala. It's a two-part discussion, so I'll begin with some of the foundational parts of this talk, and Chef Rami will take on from there on a more, I'll speak more on the theoretical, he'll speak more on the practical, although I will try to implement some of the practical in our talk today too. Anytime we speak about spirituality within the family or the purpose, really, of having family in Islam, we have to first look at the Quran and see what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for us. If relationships with the families are going to go smoothly according to how Islam intended them to be, then we have to look at our original sources, our primary sources, which of course we begin with the Quran and the Hadith. So help me, share with me what you think in terms of the sisters here in the audience. Here are some of the main ayat that speak about the purpose of us as human beings on earth in the first place. What is our purpose here? What ayat comes to mind? Yes. Barakallahu fiqhi. Exactly. Thank you. So the sister mentioned the ayah, and I'll translate, that Allah says that He has only created the humans, right? Legend, except the only reason is to worship him. So that's an, and that's the, like what I call the million dollar questions that novices are always trying to figure out. What's the purpose of life on earth? What's our purpose as humans? You have the ayah immediately on the Quran answer here. It's clear. You are here for the purpose of worship. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not intend that and the scholars who came and explained the, the ayah very the professor to not limit that worship just to your five daily prayers, or just to the month of Ramadan, or just to the Hajj that inshallah you perform, or have performed, or the Zakat it could be intended for you to give. In fact, everything that a Muslim does is what, or should be what? Worshipping him, Jannah Jalal, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us that at the central, the central focus of our point, the point of us being here on earth, is to worship him in everything you do, in everywhere you go, in everything you say, in any part and stage of your life. And women have multiple stages of life, right? The before marriage, the before kids, being a daughter primarily, a sister primarily, and then later, should marriage come into the picture, a wife, and should children come into the picture, a mother, and perhaps later, a grandmother, and later, Right, as children move and get older, move out from the home, and the grandchildren perhaps fill some of that void, and perhaps not. But the central focus always is that you are abida, the government, a abid in always, regardless of what else is happening around you. That you're not defined by the very people around you, rather you're defined by your purpose in life, which is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever stage that is. Does that make sense? All right. So that's one of the foundational principles where we begin this conversation. What else comes to mind? What does Allah say about the purpose of having children? What are they meant to do for us? I can't wait here. Ziyat al dunya. What else? Good, but what else? What is the purpose of having and procreating, having another generation? So the sister refers to a hadith, which we'll come to later about the Catholic. All right. What else? Something else? What's that? What about the word hadith? Does this ring a bell for anybody? From the brother's side, they said to continue the legacy. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his glorious book, I will place a hadith on earth, who is he referring to? To the believers. He's speaking to us, as us, the believers. Right? And for this reason, we then understand that Islamic nurturing or spirituality has everything to goes comes back to this point. Al Qiyah, right? Of the purpose Allah put us on earth to worship him, as we understand now, 
and also the next generation to bring them. What is the translation of Khalifa? The sister says successor. Right? Yes, very good. Yes, that's a different translation. Perfect. So here we're talking about then the person, people that are going to be able to cultivate this worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then we understand now our purpose and the purpose of the other people within our family and what the primary goal is according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the point where we begin the discussion. Not the point of discussion of, okay, now I'm married and I have these kids and this is my husband or vice versa, this is my wife, and now how do I deal with it? This is too late in the conversation. The conversation starts all the way over here. Right? We're in the mirror over here. Right? We need to start from the very beginning of the conversation of what was the point in the first place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. Then, as we continue talking about nurturing your tariqi and Islam, then we start to understand that this is something you have to be preoccupied with from the very beginning. It should shape and color everything that you do and all the choices that you make in your life. The choices that then are like a domino effect that affect everything else, one after another, one after another, one after another. Right? And if there is a gap somewhere, then you're going to feel that gap even within your home of the lack of balance and the difficulty in spirituality. So the sister mentioned a hadith where the Prophet is talking about having children. And what was the hadith, sister? What did the Prophet say? Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. So the Prophet, I'll translate here the Hadith. Thank you for sharing it. But the Prophet says, "Get married and have many children, for I will boast about you to other nations." So on one hand, what is your your theory? Have more and more children, and much of our Muslim community is endowed with <laughs> children. That's a lot of people. We tend to have a lot, and we usually go back to this Hadith and point to it and say that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Right? I'm going to boast about you on the Day of Judgment. True? But you see, this hadith is also balanced out by another hadith. This hadith, the first one that we just mentioned, is one about quantity. Quantity. There is another discussion, another hadith, that talks about a different concept and the two have to be balanced. This is a hadith where the Prophet is sitting with the Sahaba and he foretells about the end of time. And he says to his companions and says, how worried he is about the Muslims who are going to be later, coming with their faith. Right? And so the companions ask the weakness of their faith. So the companions ask him what? Is it for the fact that they are going to be little in number? Because when Islam started, they were little in number. So maybe that's why Islam was weak, they were people. Will it then become little in number again? And what does the Prophet say? He says, no. Very good. Exactly, sister. MashaAllah. He says, they will be many. There will be so many. What does he compare with the simile he gives? They will be like what? Yes, what's that? Very good. They will be like the foam that's on the crest of the wave. You know on the beach where you see the foam? I don't know how far the water is from here, Michelle. <laughs> but the foam, right? You see this because on California we're right on the Pacific Ocean there. So as you see though, you see the water quite a bit. And if you see the foams, right, the foam coming through on the crest, right? All this white bubbly thing. Does it have any substance to it? Is it worth anything? Nothing. It comes and it recedes again, and nothing. It's done nothing, it's given nothing. Right? And it disappears. So the Prophet says it's not because there's not going to be enough Muslims in the future, rather, there's going to be so many that they will be as weak as this foam on the crest of the ocean. Right? So from this, the two the scholars and the teachers tell us the importance of quality. There is a discussion of quantity, but also balanced with the discussion of quality, right? That investing in each and every one of the children that we have to make sure that they're going to be khulafa, right, as intended, <coughs> and worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as intended by Allah jalla 
So here, we continue then and say, the scholars, now they have this, we talked about the Quran, we talked about the Hadith literature, and now the scholars are going to let this tell us about spirituality in our homes. So the first thing they start with is say, look, when you talk about the topic of spirituality, it is incredibly important that you take this discussion from the Muslim scholars. You can take many things, many things from other points of view, from other forms of scholarship. But when it comes to spirituality, you must take this from Islamic scholarship only. And let me explain why. You see, the Muslim scholars of old understood our, our noble predecessors, understood something that only now in modern society are people finally starting to understand. The concept of the holistic understanding of a child or of a person. Right? Only now are psychologists and cognitive scientists and behavioral scientists finally understanding that all of this relates in how we raise a child. True? However, if you look at the scholars, our noble predecessors yesterday, and I was at NYU, I spent a good deal of time talking about the first hospitals in the South. And did you know that the first mental health hospitals in the world happened where and when? Where and when? Everybody from here? The first psychiatric Any guesses mental from health Any guesses hospitals. Any guesses from the side? What's that? Nothing. Oh. I know. I love oh. them, but somebody got okay. knows their history. And when in history? When? You can't um, guess. What, what stage of history are we talking about? I'll help you out. The eighth century. We're talking very early, right? Not too long after the advent of the sun. And yesterday, and I won't belabor this in today's different discussion, but the important that you understand this is when you see what the scholars of old have come up with. Then when they looked at the ill person and they wanted to treat the person, they did not just send them to the doctor. Rather, today, the hospital where I train at Stanford, they pride themselves, and as do many modern hospitals, pride themselves on something called the interdisciplinary team. Right? The interdisciplinary team. Who's what? Who's in this team? The people that care for you if you are admitted to the hospital. Who are they? The doctor, a psychologist, a social worker, good, a nurse. And if you need medications, if there's a pharmacist involved, even if they're in the background, you don't see them, if they're involved, yes. So you see all these different people make up what today they call the interdisciplinary team. Would you be surprised if I told you that the Islamic hospitals, this was the model that they had, the interdisciplinary in the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries and onwards, when only modern medicine now has come up with this concept and implemented it and pride itself on it. And if you look at where the hospitals were set up, I was mentioning about Arazi yesterday and said that he was tasked with finding out the best place to put the hospital, that he would take raw meat and put it in different parts of the land to see where the moths and bugs would come first. And the ones where the moths did not come for some time, he knew the air quality was cleaner in that area, so they would build the hospitals there. Way forward than that. Right? And the greenery and the types of treatment that was very holistic. And the person we missed, by the way, on the team was the spiritual. Right. So they integrate and understand the interlocking with the meshing concept of what it means to be a holistic community. These are our small This is your and our Islamic heritage, right? That we don't know much about in the first We put all our faith into modern medicine or all our faith into Western concepts and say, aha, they got it. When in reality, we figured it out. Millennium before them. Do you understand? MashaAllah. Nevertheless, there are concepts and theories that you might read a book on child raising, or you may read a book on human development, or you may read a book on psychology and say, oh, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of all these new age books and Dr. So-and-so and whoever so-and-so and this book was recommended by Oprah and that and whatever. Right? <laughs> you may read these books and say, hey, this makes a lot of sense. But what we're saying here is, up to a certain point, physical knowledge, cognitive knowledge, even emotional knowledge, you can take from other sources. When it comes to spirituality, it can only be 
from Islamic sources. Because non-Muslim spirituality and understanding of God and spirituality is different than our understanding, and it does not match. Also, there is a problem of maybe taking, and let me give you a historical example. Who knows the story of Samarkand? What is Samarkand? Where is Samarkand? Good. Fantastic. And what is the story of Samarkand in the Islamic history books? Okay. Tell me the story, then. What is your understanding of what Islam spread? Right? The spread of Islam. And the Muslim armies and the Muslim Muslims in general spread into other countries. They used to give the people of those countries who are not yet Muslim three choices. Three choices. What were they? Either they accept the staff and the slime becomes a Muslim land, or they pay the Jesuits, sister Michelle, or they don't accept the they, they, they accept the rule of so basically they accept the, the, the rule of the staff and they become Muslims, let's say, or they don't, but they're going to pay, they're going to retain their own religion, but they will be ruled by the Muslims and they pay the Jizya. Or what? What's the third the big What if they don't want the Muslims there? What will they do? What's that? Hmm? Fight. Yes. Jihad. This is jihad. Jihad. Brothers are saying jihad. Jihad. However, even that had rules to it. So they have to give the people that are living in those lands some time to prepare if they're going to go to war. Yes? And how much time would they give them? Did they just immediately fight them? No. How much time did they give them? This is a good history lesson here. No. No, no, no. Just a, few, just a matter of days. How many days? Three. Three. Three, three days. days yeah. So they give them three days to prepare themselves. And so in the history books, this was, you know, they'd say such and such country came into Islam, such and such country decided to have war. Okay. Well, some of them, the people of some of them did not accept that they would become ruled by the Muslim or the Jizya, they said, we're going to go to war. The history books, the Muslim history books, are written as such, and they actually consider the story of Samarkand one of their prized discussions of history and Muslim justice. Okay? Because the people of Samarkand imagine, 75 years later, how long has the longest person to in this community lived here? How long have you lived here? 30 years, and this is 30 years. Anybody lived here longer than 30 years? Anybody longer than 30? No. Huh? We have any 40, 50, 60 years? Yeah, not quite. So the Muslim community in America is still relatively young. 13 years, still relatively young. Some pockets, oh, yeah, yeah. we find people have lived in a certain yeah. place longer. Imagine in 75 years. What does that mean? It means your children have grown up, and your grandchildren have grown up, and your great and your great grandchildren have grown up in those lands. And, and there's this been an assimilation of some sorts, people intermarrying in some sorts, and, and on and on, to become part of that country, part and parcel of that country. Imagine 75 years later, the people of Samarkand go to a Khalifa at the time, who is Harun al-Rashid. And they complain to him and say, when the Muslim army came and gave us our three choices, and we chose jihad, they only, uh, or they came to fight us after two and a half years. They didn't give us the full three days. Two and a half days. So what did Harun al-Rashid rule? What would you think his role was? After 75 years of Muslims living there and being in charge. Anybody have a guess? Yeah. What's that? One of the uh, brothers says, take everybody, take the, all the army out. Exactly. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that somebody comes to you now after you've been established here, you bought your homes here, you raised your families here, and your children, and your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And they say, now you must go. The Khalifa, your Khalifa says you must leave. It's a grandfather clause, right? Okay. And that's what they did. And the Muslims start to pack up and they were starting to leave. And the people of Sabarkand are watching this happening and go, what's going on? Are they really going to listen to the Khalifa and get up and leave? They have to. They're bound by it. So as they're packing and getting up and ready to leave, the people of Sabarkand said, no, no, don't go. Don't go. Right? We actually want you to stay. We actually have prospered under your rule. And it said that on that day, having seen the justice of the Khalifa and the justice of the Muslims, 75 years later, after all that time, because they missed a half day, 
that the rulers of the time should have paid better attention to and didn't, that the justice of the Muslims, they saw that, that so many people of Samarkand came into Islam and converted. So in our history books, the Muslim history books, we can consider that a prized story of history of Muslim justice. Now, same story, but you look at it from the Western or the non-Muslim perspective. How was it written? The Muslims entered some abundant and conquered them. And then the story about 75 years later, the ruler told them to leave because it wasn't uh, the right thing, they didn't go about the right proper ways. And the Muslims got up and started to pack, and they duped the poor people of Samarkand and tricked them into staying there longer. As a story of Muslim injustice, subhanAllah. And this, I recommend you look it up in the history books. This is actually how it's written. This explains to you the difference of understanding what we call the issue of tawfiq, of verifying the sources, of understanding the sources of knowledge of where they come from. People often joke that the word history is his story. It is the story of the conqueror, right? The one who has the upper hand. And today Muslims, by and large, do not have the upper hand. So things are written about us that is not coming from us, but rather, rather from outside about us. Do you see what I'm saying? It is important that when you look at sources and knowledge that you don't get so excited about some new theory or some new concept or some new author and now make sure and do this issue of tawfiq, verifying that it fits with Islam and it actually goes hand in hand with what our beliefs are. And I deal with this all the time in my own field. I'm a psychiatrist and in the field of psychology, as you know, there's all kinds of trash that does not apply to Muslims. But there's a lot of fantastic concepts and important concepts, and so much of what I'm publishing today actually is showing that a lot of these same concepts are scholars of all kind of ranks spoken about somehow. Right? In mainstream medical journals, these things are being published for the issues of citation, so that scholars that come after can't just ignore Muslim contribution, even to a field that is considered to be not a lot of, you know, uh, people feel that psychology especially is kind of separate from Islam, but my theory is actually it's part and parcel because it is the heavy, the next and understanding of your actual nefs and how to deal with it. And our scholars have perfected this quite a bit. We're just not knowledgeable of the topic. But back to our discussion here of the issue of Tawfiq, because the topic today was on spirituality and spirituality within the family. And you can go and get any text and any books out there, all these kind of self-help and new age kind of books that talk about having a peaceful home, and having a happy home, and such and such, right? But the reality is, you can take certain concepts from them, but once you reach a spirituality, you must cut and actually only turn to the Islamic sources of what our teachers and scholars have said about this topic. Otherwise, you'll end up in an issue like that in some point, right? Well, you'll be confused by some of the topics that are there that are not applicable to them. So I wanted to make sure that that was understood clearly. Now, let's shift our attention to another thing. Where the prophets of the law and the Sunnah is speaking about children. And he brings up a very important word that we have to spend some time with if we're going to do this topic justice. It's hadith you all know where the Prophet says that every child is born on the what? And so the scholars have then descended and then the hadith goes on, right? What does the hadith actually say before we go on? What does the rest of the hadith say? And then what? Perfect, perfect. And I'll translate what you said there. That, um, that every child is born in fitra until he can speak and then his parents turn him into a Jew, a Christian, or a Zoroastrian. This topic of speak is really important. We'll get to it hopefully later. But also the topic of fitra, that every human being is born on a fitra. And what does fitra mean? What does it mean? Uh, someone said nature. What's that? What else? Hmm? Sister says the love of God. Uh, the, one of the brothers said fitrah is Islam. Islam, okay. Mashallah. Anybody else? So, you know, it's, it's, been, it's one of those very difficult words. In fact, um, <laughs> it's really funny when you look up this word in even Arabic dictionaries, like there are famous ones, like Nisan al for example. And it says, the word fitrah, it goes, al-fitrah, 
and then you're supposed to buy the definition. It says a fitra, yani fitra. We considered it to be so, um, like, uh, kind of like, it's, it's a word that we should all just understood. It's not worth <laughs> mashallah, defining. Anyhow, mashallah. The, probably one of the best translations that I've heard for fitra is a natural inclination. Like a natural inclination into what? To whom? Hmm? To the divine, yes, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's very important, and it stems from the scholars say, the time before we were even born. And what am I referring to? Before humans were born, before, before? The pledge. Good, yes, the pledge, perfect. And what did, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask us, and what did we respond? Yes, very good, yes. Exactly. He called it, it's, it's almost like a memory that has been planted from the time before we were on earth where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us souls. <laughs> yes, Alastu. Very good. Exactly. Are you do you have basically like sister said, Am I your Lord? And what do we as humans respond? Bada. Yes, we are. So there is an understanding that this is already a natural inclination that every human being is born with. But later they are potentially moved away from this problem. And our sisters and brothers who convert to Islam, many times they, uh, they prefer to be called a reaver rather than a convert because they say, I was already born on the sutra. I was just moved away and then came back. What the best terminology there is, but absolutely this idea of fitra, almost like this memory of Allah calling to his progeny to witness that he is our Lord. So here we are with this understanding of a spiritual state or a spiritual point that the human being begins from. And in terms of spiritual states, the topic people always ask about the topic of the soul or the ruh, right? And what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying in the Quran about the about this? Hmm? What does Allah say? About the ruh. Exactly. So he says, they ask you about the, the soul or the spirit, say it is from my Lord. Right? And the knowledge of it is from Allah. Meaning that even though as human beings, we don't have all of the knowledge, Allah has revealed to us all of the, the, the secret about this topic. However, what we do understand is um, all the basically the foundation, so the sound fitra is essentially the foundation from which the spiritual side or state is going to grow. So here we are now see the beginnings of the foundation of this topic, where the job then of us with each other in a home and working together, right, comes back to the topic of therapia. And what does therapia mean? Someone said discipline. Huh? Break down the Arabic for me. Upbringing is an answer from the brother's side. Good. That's another good translation. Break down the Arabic root of this word. Does anybody know the Arabic root? No. Very good. Mm -hmm. So therapia, when you break down, you take the break down to the very root, you end up with the word rub. And what does rub mean? Look your Lord, exactly. And when you say somebody is rub dani, what do they what do you refer to that as? Huh. Good. Yes. And when you say Amurabi, what does that mean? Now? Educator, an educator, okay, mashallah. Also, we may use the word nurturer. Somebody who nurtures the under the Murabi is the one who grows the love or the understanding of the Rabb, of Allah in a person's heart. Right? The Murabi. And in, and in Islamic history, the role of the murabbi was much more defined and very clear. We have essentially lost the concept of the murabbi. We may in some respects still, for some people, still maintain the relationship with a teacher, a sheikh, and in some instances a sheikha. But the murabbi category seems to by and large be gone, which is unfortunate. Because when we talk about spiritual upbringing of families and of children, you need the murabbi figure. But who is that? Ah, it's, it's not quite the mother. The mother and the father do tarbiya. They are asked by Allah and, and, and requested by Allah Sahaba to do tarbiya, spiritual upbringing of their children, absolutely. But they are not the murabi. You need a separate person who is going to 
do what? Who's going to emphasize the same set of the same rules and regulations and concepts that the parents are doing and re-emphasizes them separate from the parents, helps the parent to instill this further into the child's heart. Here we might have the word something like a mentor of some sort, right? The morapu, the nurturer. It's, and really their goal is to keep the futsuna as pure as possible as the child grows, right? And really the desire then to have uh, the, an understanding of what's brought down and the reason why our youth speak about losing this is maybe from when they were younger they were never felt connected in the first place. You see, they're born on the fitza, but unless you continue to nurture and nurture the spirituality, it will get lost along the way. And you know, this whole I should tell you, I should take a pause here and say, this topic that I'm speaking on right now is usually a very long course that I do over a series of months. <laughs> weekly classes over a series, it's, it's a long discussion. In fact, it goes through the stages of a child's development all the way from birth, actually pre-birth, pre-conception, all the way to adulthood, and broken down into stages and milestones. And this is actually my teacher's work, so I'm actually, it's actually her work that I'm teaching from. But here, she goes through the physical, behavior, physical behavior milestones, cognitive milestones, and then what's often missed is the emotional milestones of children at each stage, subhanAllah, and what's definitely not discussed are the spiritual milestones of children in different stages. And maybe this will have to be, we'll have to do almost like a teaser, or <laughs> we'll kind of share this with you and maybe we'll come back in the future, uh, maybe you will invite us back to do the full course one day, inshallah, for you to bring that to honor. But it's a beautiful, beautiful discussion of really understanding how to implement spirituality in the home. And this in her discussion in relation to children. But really, you cannot even begin to talk about children until you talk about who? Huh? Yes, the parents. <laughs> and you can't even begin to talk about mom and dad, the parents, until you talk about their, like their relationship as parents, until you talk about their relationship as what? As husband and wife. And you can't see how their relationship as husband and wife until you first talk about who they were before they were even married. You see, this topic of spirituality in the home is not about the right now. It actually starts from literally preconception, literally from who you chose as a spouse. Because people then get married, have children, and then sort of have this realization of, oh my goodness, I have no idea how to actually implement spirituality in the home. When around the discussions, and this is why I'm so happy there's some young women in the audience who are sort of up and coming, hopefully yet to be married, to really think about these topics before, before this actually happens. Do you see what I'm saying? SubhanAllah. So here, let's also say that, um, and then just kind of being, being mindful of time, I'll have to fix some certain things. Um, but you really cannot understand the law subhanahu wa ta'ala and your, the spiritual connection between you and him, Jalla Jalalahu, and experience that faith and iman without having certain aspects in place. The law subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us our intellect, right, and our senses to experience things. He's given us the heart, right, to have the desire and connection with him. And we said the topic of fitra, where the heart is already, already, if it's in a pure state, already inclined to the divine. Right, in that mutual relationship with God him. Also, you have to have ibadah, worship, and mu'amada, right, which comes from a refined nafs. So here, now, we start to talk about the spiritual side. And so really quickly, I'm going to go through kind of a quick synopsis of what this looks like before Shiframi speaks in more detail. If we talk about children, like we said, you can't talk about them even from conception, people say, let's start from like age zero, they were just born. No, you can't even start from pregnancy. You can't even start from conception, or even the marriage of the parents, but all the way from choosing this place. That's where the conversation actually has to start. Because a proper understanding of life begins with the parents' proper understanding of their son. Because the child is the fruit of that marriage that Allah gave them uh, less than the children, right? And it's not the only reason why a person gets married, because marriage is also for protection to have a partner to help them be benefited in this life and the hereafter. And if he blesses on the children, then also to have children and kind of continue that khilafah on earth. 
What's important here to know is that in order to produce these righteous people that will benefit society, there is no girl in the hearts to seek out marriage other than these reasons. Right? Protection, companionship, and if you're blessed with children, to continue on and have them children. When you look at non-Muslim marriages, if I were to say these concepts in a non-Muslim setting, they would think I was crazy. No, really. <laughs> There are, there are some who fall into the same category just as me, and they're typically faith, people of faith, right? God-centered people. But for many, that's not the purpose of marriage. Often it has a lot to do with money or not. It has a lot to do with uh, Nessa, which is what lineage, right? It has a lot to do with um, just companionship and traveling and coming and going and whatnot and status in society and the rest. Which unfortunately, a lot of our Islamic marriages have succumbed to such things as well. Where in reality, it should be much loftier goals of why people even go into a union together. Here we also say that having the selfish idea, um, and, I, and I have met and honestly I've counseled woman after woman in my office, unfortunately, where they have the like, feel that children came as a burden to them. And that could be for many reasons. Maybe they were not quite psychologically prepped and prepared for motherhood. Nobody sat them down and actually explained any of this to them, right? And then they found themselves with these crying young children <laughs> and who are whining and crying and they don't know what on earth to do with them or how to raise them properly. There was no instruction in place. And then they sort of go into this depressed state of, I don't even know if I'm doing this right. I don't even know if I want them. And, you know, and then other people say, Allah, don't say such a thing, haram, haram, right? But that's not going to help her any. What would have helped and what does help is actually talking through the prepping people before they hit the stage, right? And here, then, we also say that there has to be um, an understanding of why this marriage and why these children in the first place, if we're going to talk about nurturing and really growing spirituality in the hearts of the people in our family. And in order to have an optimum, optimal Islamic society, you really have to have understood and read and studied Islam and its history and what the point is of all of this. And also to know that when the couple marries each other, that there may very well be one who is weaker spiritually than the other. And this is a very common, common, common scenario in our families. It's, it's not, it's, it's rare, let's say, that the two aren't exactly the same way. If I were to pull you, survey all of you here in general, <laughs> and ask you how many of you feel like you're at exactly the same spiritual level as your husband, or vice versa, I would probably not get more than one or two hands, if that. Because it is not the case when you don't marry your twin. <laughs> right? You marry somebody completely separate. SubhanAllah. So, you, so that means that there's always going to be a natural weakness or a natural uh, struggle to fix this, this difference, bridge the gap between the two of them. Right? But to do so with gentleness and with love and with understanding before the children come into the picture is essential. Think about the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that had he created us, that as soon as we get married, that a woman immediately give birth, like the next week to a child, he could have but even if that couple is going to be blessed with a child immediately in the beginning of their marriage, how long does it take for the child to come to At least nine months, unless they're premature perhaps, but there's at least a number of months in between. What is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doing? Exactly. To give us as women, now I'm speaking to the women here, to give us as women the chance to go from the stage of free marriage to the stage of wifehood and get that down and the interaction with the spouse down correctly and the spirituality that needs to happen between the two of them correctly before bringing a third party into the picture with that child. Before she takes out another role called mother. Do you see what I'm saying? There is a wisdom of hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we have this. Because how do you wish it didn't have to be nine months? We know that there, there's some type of seed on the birth of Sayyidina Isa, that his mother Mary, Maryam, alayhi salam, that her birth did not, was not actually a full nine months. So had he wished, he could have, like this, decided that we have our babies. 
but there is a wisdom and a hikmah for the time to allow us to adjust. And this is a very important point that I think sometimes in our communities we're rush, 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 rush from this stage to the next stage, no marriage, no kids, no, 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 no. There isn't a time of adjusting and really understanding what the purpose of that point in our life is, or that stage in our life is. So really here we have to know and understand what this purpose and because so many of the problems encountered later in marriage start from the very beginning of marriage, but they're never addressed. The Khalil Center that Brother Kamal Kamran was speaking of, one of the many, many things that they offer, they offer for marriage therapy. But by the time you come in for marriage therapy, it's been too late, you should have scripted. For some time, people come in and they're literally telling us, you're our last resort before divorce. And we're saying, where were you 10 years ago? Do you know what I mean? And even more importantly, the Khalil Center offers something very beautiful, which is called the premarital, pre-marriage counseling. Four sessions where the two are in the room with a trained therapist who's able to then figure out the kinks between them in communication, because almost 80% of marriage is communication. Communication between the two. I can't tell you how many times I have, I usually work with all the women, but eventually, eventually, after some period of time that I work with the woman, I'll ask her to bring her husband and not for a marriage therapy per se, but for helping the counseling process. And I ask them and I observe them speaking to each other and their way of interacting. And often I'll get complaints like, I don't know when I first married him or when I first married her. She was so different, I don't know what happened. Or he was so different and look how much he's changed. Always this complaint. But in reality, you know what it is? Almost always, it's not so much, sometimes there is a real change, sometimes, you know, protect us from such things. In, in, the, in the bad, I mean, the change to the, to the worse, to all change to the better is what we want. But for often, it's not that there was this huge change that happened. In fact, what happened was there was already a major difference or major issues between them, but one or the two of them stayed silent and just let it go and let it go and let it go silently until the gap widened and widened and widened and widened between them, and then finally one of them hit the roof <laughs> and said, I can't take this anymore. Right? And then the wife says, so let's say this is the husband who was silent and silent and silent, or the wife who was silent and silent and silent, and then suddenly, you know, explodes, and the other spouse is going, what on earth happened to you? She was always bothered from the beginning, but never said anything. The differences were so stark that they could not figure this communication issue between them out from the very beginning. So then it seemed like there was this, seems like there was this very huge gap between them, but it was always there. Right? But then children came and in laws and family and so on, and it sort of you know confused the situation and nothing was ever really sorted out between them. But you see, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does things with immense hikmah, right? Where there is the time naturally built in to make sure beforehand, right? And this is one of the main points of what the wedding is supposed to do, to check the person out and make sure this is going to synchronize well, right, in the marriage. And also then, the time period of when they're first married, this is before marriage, is when you should have a premarital counseling and figure out that but so many times this doesn't even happen. Yeah, good job, good status, good family, on you. <laughs> and there isn't even a discussion of whether this is going to be the best of things. Then, let's say it is, let's say we got past that stage, then there should be this communication between them. But there's all this, you know, there's a lot of shyness and a lot of, um, in conditions that it should be there. All the modesty should be there, but there should still be this communication process ahead of time to figure out. Sometimes we have couples that come who literally the first thing they say to us is, Alhamdulillah, everything's great. They're, they're on cloud nine. They're on cloud nine. And it's, it's paradise up here. You know, mashallah, we're fine, we're fine, everything's great. There's no problems between us. The therapist starts talking, and all of a sudden, things they couldn't even think they had a problem with, they realized, oh, this is normal. We need to take a minute to figure this out, right? And mashallah, thankfully they've done that before they're living under the roof. Because it can very much explode later, right? So premarital. And by the way, this is very much part of our tradition as well, and I could speak about that for a very, very long time, but since that's not exactly the topic today, we'll save that for another day. Then, even within that, it's very help when help is needed. And so much in our community, there is this, we'll just deal with it amongst ourselves, with amongst our family, amongst ourselves. And it doesn't quite work that way. There is a loss, there is losing sight of what the whole purpose of spirituality was in the family, and the whole purpose of what marriage was in the family in the first place. Hence my earlier discussion of the 
right? My regular discussion of the teachers, the regular discussion of even the counselors, the people who can act well, who come from a place of knowledge and can actually help direct this problem. Okay? I think we spent a good deal of time on that. Let's, let's shift uh, a little bit of the discussion further more. And say that really having this, um, this uh, having an understanding that marriage <coughs> is a door, your spouse is a door to either heaven or hell. This is a very important point, and I feel a lot of people don't understand this concept. And either this spouse is going to take you by the hand into Jannah or into Jannah. It has everything to do with the choice that you make ahead of time, but let's say now you're married. Come to me, and maybe you've been married. Now you have to look at it with the eyes of this person is either going to pull me down or bring me up, and which is it going to be? And the child will be working on bringing each other up, right? Pulling each other up is the goal here, right? To pull each other into Jannah and your children along with you. This is if you have this outlook in life, then it affects everything into your interactions with each other at home. It intera and the interactions between the two of you, your interactions with your children, and your interactions with the, the family, your extended family, and the community you want. If you have this proper understanding of what the point is of you on earth, and what the point is of children on earth, and what the point is of having a home together, right? Again, the topic is not spirituality within the home, so we're laying the framework and the foundation. Now, there's so much more that we can talk about, and like I said, if we can go into the, the series of kind of from marriage to preconception and what the point of having children is, and how a mother, when she finds out that she is now expecting, she's pregnant, how to actually spiritually ready herself and psychologically ready herself for this growing fetus in her uh, body that is going to now become a baby, and what that means in those stages, in those months of pregnancy. So much is a pregnancy I find when we're doing of complaining of the nausea, complaining of the morning sickness, and I hear you, it is tough. I speak as a mother of children. Okay? I'm sitting up, I get it. Been there, done that as well. It is difficult. However, there is also a very important spiritual part of marriage. And a lot of that is the psychological effect of what is growing well here. And my teachers of spirituality have shared so many stories amazing stories. I could probably spend the whole next hour maybe talking about the stories of pregnant women and, and their connection with their baby that starts when they're, when the baby's actually in gestation, right? SubhanAllah. And the woman who read Qur'an and then their children come out later to be comforted by the sound of, the sound of Qur'an because they heard that in the womb. Right? Nowadays they have these machines that babies are rustling things of white noise and jungle noise and I don't know what noise and and it's like, what happened to the Qur'an? Had they heard you see, had they heard the recitation of Qur'an in the womb, they would be comforted by that when they're outside of the womb. Again, I could, I could quote all kinds of even medical studies that talk about the connection between the two, and at what point the baby, which is very early on, actually starts to hear, it is very early in gestation, right? And continues onward to the end. SubhanAllah. All of these things in kind of being ready with pregnancy. And also, if we talk about that, we can spend a whole time talking about the delivery process itself and how that is a time of connectedness and spirituality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as soon as the baby is born, it will also be a True? There is a reason in a hikmah why the first, very first sound the baby hears is the what? Yes. Right? The name of Allah. There is a reason for such things. Yeah, and the very first thing the baby tastes is what? Yeah, the tankiyah, exactly. Right? All of these things are so important. There's a hidden no. understanding of connecting again with spirituality and connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from literally the moments of conception and even before, as we mentioned. Right? Now no. the child is going to be born and it's going to go, let's say, from age zero, first week, right? And then we bring up no. the stages of spirituality no. all the way through the very, until they become adults. So I'll close with one example, case example, of what I mean by this. Because like I said, this is a much, much bigger discussion than we have time for today. And Sheikh Rami is going to continue the discussion a little bit further. So let's give one practical example of what I'm talking about. Let's use prayer as an example of this. You know and I know that the hadith says what about prayer? Teaching children prayer. What? What does it say? Now? 
Teach your children to pray. Oh, no, no, no. Seven. And what? What comes after? <coughs> uh -huh. We'll use the word, it's a to discipline them by ten. Okay? Seven and ten. How many of you have kids who are just about seven? How many of you have kids just about ten? How many of you have kids that are older than ten? Oh, a lot. Mashallah. How many of your kids pray regularly? <laughs> That's a lot of All right. So this is why we use this, this as an example. Because the hadith is here. And the hadith is clear. Yeah, I mean, it could be even more clear than this. And the scholars then uh, take from this hadith and explain things about song and explain other forms of ibadah based on this hadith as well. But let's just use prayer, since it's exactly the wording of the hadith. How are you going to teach your child to pray by seven? If they don't know the basics of prayer itself, or the prerequisites to prayer, which are what? Wudu, Tahara. Okay, so we're mentioning fiqh-based things. How many of you have thought to sign up your seven-year-old for fiqh classes? Ah, one. A lot of you. Two. Are there fiqh classes for children in your community? Allahu Akbar. Oh, really? Now, since there is, and the sister says this very loudly in the back, yes. Since there are, why are there only two kids there? Hmm. I don't know your community, and I don't know what's happening. I'm just kind of, I'm, from, I'm an outsider. I'm an outsider <laughs> kind of coming in. Mashallah, I don't mean to instigate any trouble. But what I need to say is a very, it's a very practical and important thing. We just spent this whole last 40 some minutes talking about, I think it's Vinama, talking about what? Spirituality in the home and children in the home and the point of being on earth and the point of parents and the point of children. And yet you have such a clear hadith of teach your children to pray by seven. How on earth are your children going to pray if they don't know the different parts of prayer? And how are they going to stand in prayer if they haven't figured out how to do wudu? And how are you going to teach wudu if you haven't spoken about bahara? What is najis, impure, and what is pure? Four children. Now, you don't need to give them a huge uh, advance book of fifth and say, here, that doesn't work for children. But you need to have somebody who's dynamic and able to engage with them and explain to them the basics of what they need to know. True? Now, that's seven. How young is seven? What grade is seven? Aha, yes, about second grade. Eight, nine, it's seven, eight, and nine that the children, little by little, are brought into the understanding and the beginnings of prayer. Because the simple part is actually teaching them how to make what doing. <laughs> That's the simple part. The more difficult part is getting them to do what? To do this regularly. And every child, subhanAllah, every child is different. Some children, like this. Okay, mom, ready to pray? Let's go. That, for that, you go, alhamdulillah, like you should be saying a little bit, but alhamdulillah, all day long. Hold it up. But many children, what, what's going on with them? Come on, prayer time, come on, prayer time. I mean, it is sometimes, and for some children, it really feels like they're pulling teeth. And then there's the question of, am I causing them to hate the prayer? Right? I mean, these are very real questions. Yeah? This is why I really think in everything that the mother and father do, assuming they're actually doing this in the first place, you need to have the murabbi or the mentor who's re-emphasizing what you're trying to emphasize, but separate from you, and is doing so in a cool and hip manner. I'm very serious about this, right? I work a lot with youth and run, I've been running youth groups for over a decade now, working with young people, right? You need those mentors, you need these young people to really be excited and excite the children about such essentially routine actions like prayer. Now some of your children do very well if you reward them. Keep a point system, they give them rewards of some sort of gifts they need at the end or like at the end. And other times, some of your children, it does reward doesn't work and it's more punishment, although I really, really suggest, personal suggestion, that punishment isn't implemented until the hadith, like the hadith says what? Yeah, by 10, and that's clear. That there is a consequence for not praying. How old, what grade is a 10-year-old in? Yeah, about fifth grade, roughly. Fifth grade. Now take a moment, and don't say out loud, when you started to pray. 
for those who pray regularly. For those who pray regularly. Mm. All right. We have somebody who's willing to say, <laughs> because it was early, Allah Akbar, sixth grade. <laughs> Most people are saying silent. Because they know that it was not, they were not in sixth grade when they first started praying regularly. Because, again, the hadith, as much and as genuine as your parents, wonderful as they probably were, this was not a central part, potentially, of raising you. But we hope that you'll have a different experience, and your children, especially in this country, will have a different experience. Because to have children in this country who are going to stop, drop, and pray five times a day, it's going to be almost miraculous. In, and really, it's not going to happen unless you put that effort in. And so what did the teachers say? They say, this is the hadith. So my teacher, for example, the one who wrote the manual on raising a spiritual child, she gives recommendations at every single stage of what to do with prayer. So she talks about the two and three and four-year-olds and how when they get really curious and they're kind of looking at you and they start to little kids and start doing the actions of prayer but they don't really know what you're doing and they get to the very bottom of the little quad and then sit you and they start doing like, you know, cartwheels or they start doing somersaults. <laughs> she says, let them be, bring them into the prayer space. This concept of children should be seen but not heard is not okay in our deen. They have to be part and parcel of the prayer space and process, even if they're doing somersaults, right? That they love being there with the family and there should be jamaah, congregational prayer between the husband and wife, okay? And there should be, and whoever, by the way, whoever's in the household, there should be prayer together and the children should see this. And then when they get a little bit older and can stand, even if they don't know the correct wording, they're just excited to put down their little kid's prayer rug and you should invest in looking for a little kid's prayer rug or perhaps make one or make them together out of felt or from the craft store together, right? And their little kufi if they're a boy or a little prayer outfit if they're a girl and they have their prayer items and they're so excited about them and you put nice smell, also a very nice smell in them. Um, and you have, and there's, a, there's an excitement because why? Because children start to connect things. You pray together, and afterwards, even though they don't know all of this parts, this is all before seven. Yeah, we're talking about four or five, six year old. Yeah, they don't know all the parts of prayer, but what they do know is that every time they stand next to you and they pray, that as soon as you finish your salams, the first thing you do is hug them. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy. I'm so excited. They see this joy and excitement of the parents, and they connect in their minds prayer with something good, something exciting something I want to do consistently because a lot of the times what children want from you as parents is your attention. And our attention, and I'm absolutely clear in this, is divided in all kinds of other distractions. They want our attention. And so when they get positive attention and they, in their little brown coins, start connecting that to prayer, imagine what prayer starts to mean to them. So we're not talking, parents always ask me, I have a 14 year old and he drives me crazy because he won't get up for salah. It's like, well, what were you doing with him when he was four? Silence. Do you see what I'm saying? The story starts early on, very, very early on. Because how that 14 year old when he was four and five and six connected to positive, and I mean, I'll do this and I'm just kind of for disclosure here, sitting with my own parents and my own children rather, and the hug afterwards, even the dickhead, even the tasbih that you do after prayer, the 33s, yeah? Even that, I'll say, instead of doing the masbaha, subha, um, the prayer beads, I'll actually say, hey, give me your hand, and I'll actually do it on her or his hand. So they feel the closeness and connection, and they're excited. They're like, they put out their hand, like, mama, do you think it on my hand? Do you think it on my hand? <laughs> and they feel that connection, right? Prayer becomes an exciting thing. Why? Because eventually they're going to reach the age that they have to now start learning the proper fifth of it, the seven, the eight, and the nine. And here's where you have your chance to slowly but surely start to go from one to two to three to four to five prayers. By ten? And I'm, and I'm like, I have to tell you, I'm like sweating, telling you this, because I have one that's about to turn ten. Just sweating these here. Mashallah, realizing the importance and the gravity of what it means that when she is ten, has to pray all five prayers. Do you see what I'm saying? But to know that as much as it has hard of a routine to build in, I know from my own childhood, and this, by the way, I thank my father for this, because although I was a girl, and although I had brothers, I always was brought to the prayer with him. He said, I mean, let's go pray to Let's go pray. Let's go always, side by side with him. Always. 
And I can't tell you from the psyche and for me as a girl, as a little kid, what that did to me. Because it was my exciting time to be with my father. Do you see what I'm saying? And although he was a very busy person doing a lot of important things out there and didn't have a ton of time, the time that was there was a quality time. Do you see what I'm saying? People complain all the time about their spouse being busy and so on. But the time that is there is quality and is spiritual in nature. And I know, well, God and Adam, that there's a direct correlation between that as a child and later being excited to study that and go forward. Right? So I recommend that this happen. And then I have mothers who say, but my husband doesn't pray or doesn't pray regularly. Mothers, you should know parents, parents in general, men and women here, because sometimes I get the opposite complaint too. The husband prays, but the wife doesn't. Say, look, for children, for children, it takes at least one, preferably two, granted, preferably two, but even one. I can't tell you the number of people who have said, I only have one person who prays. Maybe it's a mother, maybe it was a father, maybe it was a grandparent. But because of that one person, they came out praying regularly. Do you see? And it, was an, and it was something they're fond of, they're excited about, they're happy with. Look, for anybody, routine is hard. Five times a day is a routine. And it takes a lot of pre-planning. And a lot of effort. We know that. Look, I'll give you a very small and almost any excuse the example. But here in a masjid, to go make wudu, it's set up for you to make wudu. To go and to use the restroom at Afwan, it's set up for you to do so. But you go outside to the shopping mall, or to your soccer game, or kids' soccer game, and now it's prayer time, what will you do? You literally have to pre-plan. In your purse, I sure hope all of you are carrying your little lota around. <laughs> right? Because American bathrooms don't have such things for cleansing yourself. True? And then there's the issue of making wudu in public, which I sure hope everybody's gotten comfortable enough to put their foot in the sink by this point in time. Yes? And make proper wudu. And then to have the comfort of praying in public, which whether if it's in the mall, that's easy because you find a store that has a fitting room and you pray. But if not, then you find any quieter corner and you pray there. Or if in your soccer field, you find a corner there and you pray on the grass. Allah has made the earth a masjid for the Muslim. Do you see what I'm saying? It takes pre-planning though to remember your five daily prayers. And when your children do see you do that, then they will do so too. But don't say later, why does my child not pray? And yet, they'll, they'll be out with you shopping, grocery shopping, or a regular shopping at the mall, and they'll see Bohut come in and out, Asif come in and out, Melody come in and out, and you've done nothing. And then you're going to wonder why they're not praying. Allahu Akbar. Right? So here's what we say. Like, this takes effort. It takes real heart. It takes real pre-planning. It takes understanding what the point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having put us on earth has been. So that when they reach the age of 10, and now Allah Taala says, discipline. I know the word in Arabic is what? Yes. Love, right? It's a hit, and often translated as such. Some children, that works. Some children, it doesn't matter what you do, that doesn't work. So what does work? And why I've heard my teachers often say, forgive those who may not agree with this translation, but have said, to discipline. Because for some, taking away all their Legos, or a portion of them, like in our family, <laughs> works. For others, taking away some sort of privilege, they'll feel the pinch because they can't go over and spend the night at their cousins or they can't have their cousin over or whatever the case may be, or they can't go to such and such place or they can't go to soccer practice. Ouch. But this did nothing to them. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's a consequence for having left that prayer by them. And then if we go further and continue down the line, if that's happening and you're serious about that from when they're little kids all the way from 10, as they go into their tweens, right? 12, 13, 14, right? Onto their teen years. Now we're talking just about a matter of habit. And one of the main things, and I will close with this, forgive me, Shafran, I've gone a little further, but one of the main things that I'll close with here is that people often complain about teens. And our teachers of spirituality explain to us that teenagers, this concept in this age called teenagers, is a Western construct that did not exist in Islamic societies. You went from before puberty, you were a child, and after you're considered an, an adult. Now, granted, you're not ready to maybe, you know, balance a checkbook and all the rest, perhaps. But in terms of the, on the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you being our teens, meaning puberty time, right? In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are ready to take on the same spiritual responsibilities as adults. 
a prayer and a fasting. SubhanAllah. Right? So what does that mean? That means that falling into this idea that, oh, they're teenagers, therefore they are supposed to rebel, they're supposed to yell, they're supposed to slam doors, they're supposed to be disrespectful garbage. It has no essence in our deen. Granted, there might be a little bit of trying to figure out their identity, but you know what the, the, the teachers of spirituality say about this stage? They say this is the peak, the peak of spirituality. Allah of them. That mid-teens into about the mid-twenties, that is, they call it the peak of spirituality. Why? Because this is the stage before responsibilities, Often, children aren't going to be married at 15 and 16, at least not in this society right now. They don't have the responsibility of caring, all, most of the time, of caring for others, that, that's coming still, right? They don't have yet a spouse, they don't have children, they don't have elderly parents, perhaps, that they have to not take care of. They're in a different stage of life, where, and they're not yet, they're not children anymore. They are actually wide and res wide, wiser and a little more responsible and can understand more. So when they're in this middle stage, and now they have both time and intellect. What do teenagers usually fill their time with? Not tell me. What do they usually fill their time with? Social media. What else? Huh? TV. Yes. What else? Drama. <laughs> okay. All right. Huh? Music. Yes. Actors, musicians, so on, pop star, whatever. These people that are now their role models and so on. Right. Uh huh, defining themselves. But if you define yourself with these aspects and you put your look, think of your time and intellect. And I just explained the teachers of spirituality say this is the peak of spirituality. This is the stage of life. And if you get it right, you have the time to have what they call the taste of Iman. <coughs> to really experience the connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're saying to me, what, at 15 and 16 year old, are you serious? Well, I am speaking from personal experience. And I'm speaking from experience of the, the young people like myself who had studied early on at Hamdi Lila for Tabarak And I'll tell you something. If this is the stage, because you don't have the responsibilities of children waking up in the middle of the night crying and you have to go deal with them and work the next day and such and such and other thing, you can get up for Tahajjit without any problem. You can get up and call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can get up in prayer and beseech Him. You can get up and do as many of God as you wish and as much put on as you wish and as much learning and hop from master to master and place to place to learn and massage it and so on and, and speakers and, and scholars and the rest. Either you will fill that void or that, that part of your life, the peak of spirituality, with a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and literally live off of it for the rest of your life going forward and always think back to those days. Or, you will fill that void with boys, with singers, with actors, with drama, with rubbish, teenage rubbish. And, and also nothing means nothing and nothing. And it will do nothing for you, except for potential heartache in the future. So the heart, and forgive the words here, I know we have some younger people in the audience, so I'm careful of the words I'm choosing, but either you're going to lean towards spirituality, or you're going to lean to what this society promotes Intensely. <laughs> Somebody said it in the audience, yes. And I won't say it because we have the only people in the room, but I'll use a similar word, promiscuity. Right? Either you're going to lean this way or you're going to lean that way, and that's what those peak <coughs> of spirituality is going to be filled with. Does that make sense? So now we really start to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted from us on earth, but the point when he says he's only created us except to worship him at every stage of life. And this now is the foundation for interacting together, right? For when you interact with your family members, when the spouses interact together, and when you interact with your children. This is the foundation, which I hope, inshallah, we laid that foundation for now, Shaykh Rami, to take from, from here and pick up from here on some more practical discussion on this. So we'll just let you know we're taking a five minute stretch break. We'll just stand up and stretch, inshallah ta'ala, and sit right back down to listen to him والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العظيم العظيم. Thank you so much. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله.